a large parish covering 3,800 acres with over 1,100 people and situated in the rural northwest of Essex, about six miles from Saffron Walden and 38 miles north of London. It was the Saxons who first named this settlement by the river Stort, Clawlinga, which means the place where the clover grows. But very likely, they were settlers here long before the Saxons. For now and then, a whisper from the past, Bronze Age or Neolithic axe heads, Iron Age pottery, Roman coins, blows across these fertile lands, speaking of early farmers who made clearings in the Essex forest thousands of years ago. We know little of those distant times, except that through all those centuries, almost every person in Clavering was somehow connected with the land. Whereas today, only a dozen farmers and just a handful of farm workers now work on the fields. Yet from this chalky boulder clay, remnant of the Ice Age, they produce yields undreamt of by their ancestors. far fewer close links with the agriculture which nurtured its past and the houses are full of new country dwellers who usually work in town and yet far from declining under this great change Clavering has flourished as never before with numerous facilities and over 30 clubs and societies there is a vitality here which eludes definition a happy blend of initiative friendliness and community pride Native villagers and energetic newcomers combining to produce a busy and vibrant community. And one with a fascinating history. Once upon a time, a great Essex lord built a castle here. The lord was called Robert Fitzwymark, and the time was the 11th century before the Normans came. Robert's son, the mighty Swain of Essex, was lord of Clavering at Doomsday, but little is known about his castle. Now an acre of grassy mounds, bird-haunted moats, overgrown banks and ditches, evoking long-lost mysteries. What sort of castle was it? Why was it here? Why, after all that effort in building, was it abandoned so soon? No one knows, for the site has never been excavated. The ancient monument keeps its secrets. All we know is that around 1250, a splendid new manorial residence arose. Berry Manor. Until recently, no one knew its medieval origins because 17th century owners had rebuilt the house in a different style, putting on three gables. In 1976, historians climbed inside the attic to examine the smoke-blackened roof beams, revealing that the bury once had a central hearth open to the roof. This and the cat slide roof at the back confirmed that the bury was built as an aisled hall. A sub-manor of the bury was Curls Farm, scene of the Lamb Sunday event every March. I'm Brian Carter, who's the chairman of the Church Restoration Fund. I took over from Hunter Row, whose farm this is, and it was very kind, we opened it again for another Land Sunday. 
We had one last year as an experiment and it seemed successful. So we repeated it again this year and it is quite honestly an outstanding success. I don't know how many people will have been, but it must be somewhere near 2,000. From all over Cambridgeshire, Hertfordshire, Essex and even more. During recent years, events like Lamb Sunday have helped contribute over £120,000 to restore the beautiful parish church. The church history has been much studied by the local history group and its organiser, Eileen Ludgate. Clavering Church, dedicated to St Mary and St Clement, is big and imposing for a village. It shows how prosperous farming here must have been 600 years ago when this church was built. The carved screen is from the 15th century. It still has traces of bright colouring on the tracery and outlined figures of saints on the panels at the bottom. The roof, also from the 15th century, especially interesting for the big carved figures of seraphim on the main rafters. In the northwest corner are elaborate monuments to the family of Haynes Barley. His first wife gave him four daughters and two sons and died in childbirth. His second wife had no children, but the inscription says she brought him a fortune, which must have paid for both these monuments. This is the inscription which Haynes put up to his parents and grandparents. And this is the monument to Haynes himself. 
who had a third wife and more children and lived to the age of 90. The pulpit is Jacobean from the early 17th century but is set on an earlier medieval base. The font is older than this building. It must have come from the earlier church here. The knight is also older than the building itself. He was the builder of Clavering Berry. Another regular annual event is the Easter Flower Festival, when the church is filled with the sight and sense of floral arrangements in every nook and cranny. For while the art of flower arranging flourishes at one end of the village, there is creativity at the other end too. looking at the fine houses in Church End and Middle Street. Again, Eileen Ludgate is our guide. Church End, the lane leading from Pelham Road into the churchyard. It must be the most photographed view of Clavering. On the left are two of the most interesting houses in the village. First, the long-fronted house, now called the Old House. It was built in three stages, the first house about 1500 with two big additions, 
of about 1600 and about 1700. The red brick section was the Queen Anne edition of 1700. The interior of this part has a handsome staircase with wall paintings and rooms with fine panelling and carving. For nearly 300 years, this house was a shop. It must have been a very prosperous shop when the extension of 1700 was built. This is the shop in 1911. When it was finally closed, it was bought by a lady looking for an interesting home in the country. And she restored it very well. The house at the entrance to the churchyard was originally a guild hall built about 1500 by the better off parishioners as a sort of clubhouse for their social activities and close to the church for their most important religious services. The hall for meetings was the whole of the upstairs. The ground floor was divided and possibly let for living accommodation or shops. When such guilds were abolished at the Reformation, the building was acquired by the parish and used as a poorhouse until 1835. Then it went into private ownership and was converted into five little cottages. And the one-storey addition was built for a school. Some Clavering people can still remember when this part was used for cookery lessons and as a village hall in the evenings. Now it has all been made into one house. Facing the churchyard is the one remaining oriel window. Originally there was a row of oriel windows right along the upper front of the guild hall. Notice the end of the dragon beam coming out from the corner of the building. This is the back view the original stairs were at the back on the outside and have long since disappeared. The chimneys are additions. There were no chimneys to heat the original guild hall. A hundred years ago, there was another row of little cottages right across the garden at the back. Opposite the guild hall are two very attractively renovated cottages. The other side of the churchyard, at the entrance to the manor house Clavering Berry, is Middle Street. Middle Street slopes down to the ford over the river Stort, has a most picturesque collection of houses and cottages from the 15th to the early 20th centuries, renovated, reorganised, added to throughout their long history, especially in the last 50 years. In the last century there were several shops, a blacksmith's, a wheelwright's, a public house, all in Middle Street. It was the real centre of the village. This is the big house at the Berry Gate, facing down to the Ford. A fine example of a big farmhouse of about 1500, with a hall in the centre and an upper storey each side. For a hundred years, it was the Clavering Post Office. At the other side of the Ford is the tiniest cottage in Clavering maybe in Essex. One room up, one room down, it has no space for stairs, just a ladder. But it was well built and neatly finished, probably in the 17th century. The splash of bright yellow from fields of oilseed rape signifies spring is really here. The village calendar moves on to Bank Holiday Monday, and it's time for the fete. set up their wares, the older residents remember the great village fairs before the war, held on chapel or town meadow, with steam driven roundabouts, flying horses, swing boats, coconut shies, homemade sweets, roller penny and much tippling. At one time it was so rowdy the authorities tried to ban it, but people took no notice, it was their day out and they deserved it.
The Women's Institute busy themselves making hundreds of teas. And the brownies open the day with their May Queen entourage. Spring is a new life. The sun is nice and warm in spring. Puppies are in the fields and rabbits are peeping from their holes. I hear the birds singing in the wind. I see the bluebells growing in the woods and the lambs bouncing around the meadow. Many a baby deer is born in spring while the birds, while the buds are bursting and trees are creaking under the weight of the nesting. The birds are twittering in the branches which are full of green leaves. Spring is happy, spring is joyful, spring is a new life. Welcome to Bravery Fight. We hope you all enjoy yourselves. Thank you, yes. We hope you do enjoy yourselves. Have a very good day. Thank you. Another old tradition in Clavering is the cricket match. Adults at play and children at play, all in the summer sunshine. The youngsters of Clavering Playgroup have a great time.
Friendships forged at Playgroup continue at our modern village school, built only in 1973, but heir to a long tradition going back to 1810 when the first Sunday school opened. Later, there were two day schools, one Anglican, the other non-conformist, and great rivalry between the two. The little churchyard school is still fondly remembered. When I was a child, says Margaret Watson, we lived at Moat Farm about two miles across the fields. And each weekday, my brothers, sisters and I walked to school. In the winter, we stopped first at our grandparents' house to change from boots to shoes and tidy ourselves before carrying on along the road to school. The local policeman tests some of the children on their cycling proficiency. The school also has a herb garden, which makes an attractive learning resource. shops existed in various locations before Doug Luff got the blacksmith's corner shop going after the war. Nowadays, under the Visana family, it sells just about everything, like the village shops of old.
only thing it doesn't sell is petrol. This was the shop next door in the 1960s with its petrol pumps outside. However, the shop with the oldest tradition was Fairbanks in the High Street, pictured here in horse-drawn days, which after 300 years as a store, is now a private house, Pavitt's. Now it's high summer up on the fields, the wheat ripening towards harvest, while down in the valley a harvest of a different kind comes along, the annual horticultural show. The conservation area of Clavering has at its centre one of the two remaining public houses. Firstly, the Fox and Hounds, which has kept the same name for centuries. And our other pub, originally called the Bricklayer's Arms, of Wales and finally called the Cricketers, appropriate for a village where the game has been played for over a century. A summer event in 1990 was the service of celebration to give thanks for the 10-year church restoration program.
the service, 200 people took tea in the village hall. for numerous activities, such as the weekly library. over 30 years ago and still consistently providing first-class shows twice a year. The village hall was built by community effort and opened by Rab Butler, RMP, in 1937. And exactly 40 years later came the Jubilee Field next door, an award-winning asset much enjoyed by the villagers, their children, and not least, the football, tennis and bowls clubs.
For the less energetic, there are a wealth of ancient byways for summer wanderings. Gypsy Lane, a tunnel of dappled greenery. Or you could walk over the fields to the old mills. Long bereft of their great sails, but still a landmark, a visible reminder of our rural roots. There was once a third mill, a wooden one, which blew down in a gale. That must have been a rare sight, three mills turning together. And there are other walks to the Seven Greens, like Sticklings, a true ancient chalk meadow, it's past or past, no more than a memory, but beautiful still. Near Sticklings Green, this set of buildings mirrors farming change, the old malting surviving as an old farmhouse. While behind is Clavering Court, its elegance reflecting prosperous times in 19th century agriculture. And this barn conversion in front is typical of more modern development on farms today. Sticklings, Starlings Green was named after its medieval owner and remains today a quiet hamlet as in times past. These old photos show the White Horse Inn. Now a private house. This little hamlet has known great drama, for in 1921 there was a severe drought and the pumps were padlocked and the cattle died of thirst. One July day a fire started and there was no water to put it out. The hamlet was destroyed. One elderly spinster returned in the carrier's cart from an outing to Bishop Stortford to find her home gone and with it all her savings. Seventy years on, 1990 was also a dry summer. But good harvest weather, and all around the parish, majestic combines made light work of a task which once took weeks of backbreaking toil. A generation has seen a revolution in farming, from cart horse to tractor, from side to combine. Yet still, Clavering retains some long-established family farms, like that of Arnold Hitchcock. We've farmed here for over 50 years. It's a family, family partnership. Uh, called me, I was with my father, who was in partnership uh, with a man named Reg Tinnit. And now it's time, me and my son uh, and my wife. Uh, we've been tenants here for 
over the 50 years, but then more recently we have bought the land and it's now in family, family ownership. Creating wheat here, we're combining what is in fact a very nice crop indeed, and amazingly we're going through the third year of very good harvest weather. Great help to us in reducing costs, particularly drying costs, because wheat can only be sold at 15%. Highly methodized, uh, very sophisticated combine, computerized controls for all the monitoring systems on the, on the combine. And of course, advent of machinery has led to a tremendous reduction in labor. We're farming just under a thousand acres together with two men, as my son and myself, just two men. A tremendous contrast to the position, say, 12 years ago in 1979, when we had 12 men. The crops we grow are wheat, oilseed, rape, peas, and beans. Peas are growing this year for human consumption. We grow potatoes, but they're on contract for another grower, but we're doing all the, all the work. And then we also grow, grow grass for conservation. And this is processed by a local farmer. This is a product called Horsehead. Back is packed, and there's a very, very strong demand for sticking to overseas markets. So an interesting farming farming system. We were facing a lot of changes, the pressure of over overproduction. Of course, in 1992, and on stubble burning comes in, in October 1992, so we have one more year. But like a lot of farmers, we are now burning steps, starting to look at systems of incorporating straw. It's going to take time to realize how to do it, but farming's always a, a matter, of, matter of change, and more now responding to the needs of the market and the market demand, and of course, opening the country to the environment and what people want to do the audience. I hope that I'm trying to understand the same sort of thing as I am now. But I hope uh, what I have to say and what we're doing just adds to the history of favoring, favoring as one develops a very fascinating film about what goes on in the countryside around us. school children sing harvest hymns even while the farming cycle begins all over again.
the United Reformed Church, Clavering folk come together with the Royal British Legion once more to remember those lads who never came back to grow old in their native village. another regular event, the fireworks party on the Jubilee field. Thank <laughs> you. 
And so the village comes together once more for the Christmas Day service. A communal conclusion to a year of community life in Clayworth.